Welcome to this Ellis County Amateur Radio Club Extra Class License Course. My name is John. My ham radio call sign is AI6A, and I will be your instructor. The class license in ham radio is like the PhD of ham radio. That means it's piled higher and deeper. But you will need to plan to do all of the homework assignments. You'll need to read the study guide material and learn the answers to all the question pool questions. For this class, you will also need a copy of the Amateur Radio Relay League's 10th edition of the Extra Class License Manual, which you can purchase from the ARRL over the internet. You'll need a basic scientific calculator, and we also recommend that you purchase a copy of the um, ARRL's Extra Q&A Question and Answer Guide. So, let's get started. We begin with electrical RF and physical safety. I am always amazed at how little electrical current it takes to cause major problems. As you can see here, even as little as 100 milliamps can cause a normal heart rhythm to be disrupted. Whenever you must work inside of electrical equipment, make sure to turn off the power before beginning to do so. Also, it's really important to make sure that equipment is properly grounded and circuit protected. And when you're going to be working on electrical equipment or towers, don't forget to lock out and to tag out so that others will know that you're there. If you should be working with someone who is electrocuted, the first step is to shut off the power, then call for help. It's a really good thing to learn CPR and first aid for moments like that. By the way, it's the National Electric Code that determines what the requirements are for electrical safety in the ham shack. By the way, be sure and use the right type of plug and connector for the electrical wiring in the ham shack. If you are using a generator, be sure to locate it in a well-ventilated area. The generator should be well grounded and extra fuel should be properly stowed. Be sure not to connect a generator directly into your house wiring. Doing so would be a shock hazard to a repair person working on the feed line during a power outage. You should also probably you would also probably overload the generator inadvertently, trying to feed the entire neighborhood. The generator could catch fire or explode when the power comes back on. An RF ground consists of an actual wire from your ham equipment to an 8-foot copper ground rod. The ground wire should be short in order to avoid being a resonant length. Ham shacks on the second floor or down in the basement can be problematic from a ground standpoint because the long run to the outside ground rod. Here is an example of good RF grounding. Notice that all the equipment is connected to a common point, the ground bus. The station grounding system needs to be made with good tight connections to avoid generating RF hotspots. One possible cause of broadband RF noise can be a poor ground connection. A single point ground where all the ground connections are tied to each other and to the earth ground rod at the single spot can help prevent ground loop noise. Now, let's talk about RF exposure. The fundamental problem with too much RF exposure is that RF energy can heat body tissue depending on RF intensity and frequency. However, with proper precautions, RF exposure can be minimized. Body parts absorb RF energy more efficiently at certain frequencies and result in higher risk. 
we have to exercise more caution at certain frequencies than at others. The key term that we're dealing with is known as maximum permissible exposure, MPE. We are all required to perform an exposure evaluation. At lower power levels, no evaluation is required. Moving an antenna is one way to lower RF exposure. Also, we must make sure that people can't get RF burns from touching our antennas. Here is a drawing of some of the antennas you might eventually be dealing with. There are several factors that determine RF intensity. One is power density, which is based on how much power you are running. Another is antenna gain and proximity to people such as yourself and your neighbors. Another is the duty cycle of the mode that you're sending. RF safety calculations are based on two terms of reference, field strength at the location in volts per meter and power density at the location in watts per square meter. You can lower the power density by moving further away from the RF source. For instance, doubling the distance reduces the power density to one-fourth. You have to perform an RF evaluation if your peak envelope power, your PEP, input to the antenna exceeds the limit shown here. For instance, with my linear amplifier cranking out 1500 watts on any of these bands, I must perform an RF evaluation. Here is a plot of the allowed RF exposure versus frequency. Note that the plot is more conservative for a controlled environment rather than an uncontrolled environment. Also, the 30 to 300 megahertz region is the most conservative frequency range, of, range region for RF exposure. This includes 2 meters. The duty cycle of most modes is less than 100 percent. For instance, conversational single sideband is only 20 to 40 percent and conversational CW is 40 percent. That means that there is less RF exposure than if the duty cycle is 100%. To lower the RF exposure, you can reduce your power, rotate the antenna, keep people away, lower the antenna gain, or move the antenna array. RF exposure is a function of whether you have a controlled environment or an uncontrolled environment. A controlled environment means that you know where people will be located relative to your antenna system. An uncontrolled environment means that you have no control of where people will be located, in which case less power is allowed. What we must do is, number one, evaluate the RF exposure of our station. Number two, mitigate any excessive exposure. And number three, keep the evaluation on file and available for inspection. We have a choice between two methods of evaluating RF exposure. One is to use the ARRL web-based calculator. The other is to use FCC Bulletin 65 guidance. If we find that we have that we are exceeding the RF exposure limits, we can look for additional factors such as cable losses, duty cycle, and actual antenna gain, or we can change to the FCC analysis method. If all else fails, then we must take more dr drastic measures like reducing drive power to lower RF exposure. Here is an example of the analysis. In this case, the estimated RF power density came out as 0 0.0580 milliwatts per square centimeter, which is less than either the controlled or uncontrolled limits, so the station is in compliance. Here are some resources available on RF exposure.